It's not about people's lifestyle. That's what the industry wants us to think. Welcome to Climate Curious. We're coming to you live from TED Countdown. Which is TED's Climate Summit. Now, we all know that TED is normally about sparking curiosity, ideas, even inspiration. But sometimes an issue requires more than that. And climate change is just that issue. So TED Countdown is all about impact. It's all about action. Right, and we've had an amazing opportunity to speak with some of the world leaders in the climate movement. So this season of the podcast is going to be intense and it's going to be amazing. There are going to be some moments of silence, some moments of awe, definitely some laughter and some unexpected climate confessions. Some things that you've definitely never heard before. (laughs) It's a good season. It's a good season. So let's, let's get started. Ben, there was one talk um, that, you know, when sometimes you realize, like, you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know moment. (laughs) Like a really, um, one of those things like, how how do I not know this? How is not everyone talking about this? This is insane. And I can't wait to watch this talk like seven times because I need to absorb every minute of it. Yeah. So we have that speaker here with us today. Do you know what? That is such a, uh, I think maybe I've missed we have, I haven't paused and thought about how good this is. Do you know what I mean? Like, what a great opportunity to, like, see a talk and be like, wow, what an amazing speaker. What an amazing thing. Now let's ask them all the and questions. Now come and chat to us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay, so uh, welcome, Zipporah Berman. Um, you you have been called, I have this from your bio, so you can tell <laughs> me if you're, it's wrong, but you've been called an eco-terrorist, which I want to hear about because that's mad. Um, you're also the chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, and I think we're going to talk a lot about that. But will you tell people who don't know what any of those words I've just said mean, who you are and what you do? <laughs> What is that? (laughs) Um, I'm from Canada. I've been working on environmental campaigns now for 30 years. Um, Let me see. What else can I tell you about me? I I live in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I started out my journey as uh, as a student trying to figure out, you know, I cared a lot about and I thought a lot about what was happening in our environment, mostly forest issues back then. And but I didn't know what to do. And so I feel like I've spent the last 30 years trying to figure out what to do mm. um, and and looking at what makes change. How do we build power? How do you, what do you, if you if there's an issue that's like keeping you up at night, what do you do when you get up in the morning? That's been my like everyday journey. <sighs> that's such and, a good way of phrasing that. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the eco-terrorist comment in the bio is that when I first launched one of some of my first campaigns on trying to protect old growth forests, we're talking thousand years old, and thousand this is in year old Vancouver, trees. This is in Vancouver. In British Columbia. Oh, British Columbia, okay. The premier of the province, it's like the governor of the state, you know, the premier of the province on national television called me an eco terrorist. <laughs> wow. And and That's then quite an and, and an enemy of the state. Yeah. For trying so, to protect the, the for trying for for saying that we needed to stop logging the old growth forests because not only had I been arrested on the logging blockades but I had then gone fi- and figured out who was buying the stuff and then I went and talked to the customers and convinced some of the customers which ironically was like there was a wildlife magazine in the UK there was Scott paper in the UK was making toilet paper out of thousand year old trees from Canada at the Yo. time. And so I and I went and met with these companies and convinced some of them to cancel their contracts because really actually making changes about building power. Right. You know, and 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 so I wanted to force the government and industry to listen to us. And when those multi-million dollar contract cancellations happened, the government called me an eco-terrorist and an enemy of the state. Wow. And it was a crazy time in my life. I was like in my mid-20s. And if I walked down the street in Canada, people would either hug me or spit on me. And you <gasps> never quite knew which was going to happen until you were right face to face with them. I mean, them. that's proper. That's front lines. That's like really the front lines of this work. Uh, I'm so glad we're talking to you. Do you know why? Because I think... I imagine that there's a, a part of our audience who are those people, who are the young people now mm. who are doing this work. Oh yeah. Who need that. Like, what do you do? <laughs> what do you, what do you do when you've made the, when you've made the change, you've done the statement and you're the person that has to carry the burden of like walking down the street and literally not knowing if someone's going to, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'd love to find out. I feel like the, there's a couple of things that I think about every day. Mm. And, and one is, is the work I'm doing 
um, giving me juice. Right. Like, is it, it, you know, like sometimes you can get all in your up in your head, you know, I should be working on this issue in this way. I should be writing policy briefs because the policy is where people take you seriously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a great implementer. You know, I'm an academic. I have a couple of degrees. I can read policy and understand it. But mm -hmm. when I start working on the details of policy, it's like watching paint dry. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm really bored and I can't focus. And then there are probably other people who see what I do, you know, public speaking or or, or um, negotiating with governments or being on the front lines of blockades. And they think, oh, my God, I'm terrified of that. So I really think every day we should be thinking about where you feel best because we need all of those tools in our toolbox, right? There's no one way to make social change. You need all the pieces. And so I think about where do I feel best? Um, and then I think about who has the power to make the change I want to see in the world? And how do I focus? Because if, you, if we focus on trying to get something done, we'll get something done. But if we just swim around in the issues, we'll just depress ourselves and then we can't function. Yeah, so Drew, I, I don't <laughs> Have you been eavesdropping on our conversations? Yeah, like very much. You know what it is, is, is people listening at home won't know this, but when I listened to your talk, I was literally just crying. Um, and I feel that way now because... Not because it's sad. <laughs> that is so powerful because I do think that people think there's one way to do it. There's one way to be. If I am going to make a change, I have to be chaining myself to something or gluing myself to something or I have to be – or on the other end, I'm only going to be taken seriously if I only work in a professional diplomatic – you know, all those things. All those things where people feel like they have to be one way and not another and it doesn't feel right to them. It, surprisingly, it was pretty easy for me. Um, I, I The first time I went to a protest a blockade, there was a local community who was blockading the rainforest. And, and I went because I had been doing trying to help the scientists. I'd never been to a protest in my life, <laughs> and I was terrified. And so I thought, I'm just going to go help the scientists do their scientists work. And, and I was kind of bored, and I'm helping them. And, and then the next... Um, time I came back to that area of rainforest, the whole thing had been logged. Oh my gosh. And I, and I was like stumps the size of houses and there's like eagles screaming overhead looking for their nests. And it's just like devastation as far as you could see. And I was just like, okay, what do I do now? And it happened to be there's this van of hippies from Australia coming through and they're like, the local community is blockading up north. Come on in with us. And I'm like, okay. And I got in their van and I, and I went with them and I ended up on this blockade and I didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, so I'm a good Jewish girl from Toronto and I know how to cook. Mm -hmm. And so I cooked in the camp for people and just watched it all happen. You know, I was like, I don't know what to do. And, and I was so inspired by all these people. There was like doctors and nurses and scientists and they're all getting arrested and being hauled off to jail. And I was just so inspired by them. And one day the person who was the lead spokesperson had been arrested and someone just handed me the megaphone. Wow. And I was like, and they were like, you've been here the longest. I'm like, oh, I'm the cook. <laughs> I've been cooking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I... And I found my voice that day. I just picked up that megaphone and I and I and I said, "They, you know, I can't remember. The, I think it was the something about freedom. I remember it was this moment where I where I said, "They say they're taking our freedom, but this is freedom to stand here and blah blah." blah. And I just started talking, and people started plotting and Christ. and then afterwards, all these people came up to me and said, "Thank you so much. That's exactly what I was thinking." And uh, I thought, "Oh, I could do that." Yeah. And I didn't uh. know I could do that. And so since then, I, you know, I mean, I do a lot more than just public speaking, but that right. was one of the things that yeah. I, I found. I was like, okay, I, I'm good at that. That is. Yo. There's so much in that. I mean, we could just spend like three hours talking about <laughs> right. that story. No, but we, we have to talk about too. the fossil fuel treaty. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I want to know. I said, I said, you are the chair of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty initiative. Will you tell us what that is and how that means for people who are like, I don't, I don't have any clue. What is a treaty? Here's the thing. For decades, our countries have been negotiating missions and targets. So how much each country gets to pollute? Because the pollution which is 86% um, of everything trapped in our atmosphere comes from three things, oil, gas, and coal. Mm -hmm. So the pollution from predominantly fossil fuels is trapped in our atmosphere. It's smothering the planet. It's creating climate change. We all know that. And our governments have been negotiating who gets to pollute and how much. What I didn't realize until I had my own experiences in Canada with a government that 
said they were going to do the right thing, but then the emissions didn't go down mm. and they kept approving new oil drilling and fracking, right. is that our governments don't regulate who produces fossil fuels and how much. And so that's mad. right now, it's madness, right? So we're currently on track to produce 120% more fossil fuels right now in the next decade than the world can ever burn. So it's like we're stockpiling. And fossil fuels today are this generation's nuclear weapons. They are the weapons of mass destruction because we know that these three things, oil, gas, and coal, are the things that are killing us. They're heating the planet. They're killing thousands of people. And we know that and we have alternatives to them. But our countries are just allowing companies to keep building them more and more and more of them. I think this analogy to nuclear weapons is one of the most profound things I've heard. Right. Actually. The... With nuclear weapons, no country would stop yeah. unless another country stopped. Yeah. That's the situation we're in now. When I asked my own government, how can you say you're a climate leader and you're going to keep producing more and more tar sands and fracking? And they said, well, if we don't produce it, Saudi Arabia will or someone else will. So we have to keep producing it. Mm. And I said, but you know, we're already producing more than the world can ever burn. Right, you've got enough. So we're spending all of our financial, our technical capital to dig up stuff that we can't burn. And if we do, it will burn us. And they know that, but they're all spending our money, taxpayers' dollars now to subsidize more oil, gas, and coal, even though we have enough already on the surface of the planet to use while we transition to renewable energy. So it's very similar to nuclear weapons. We're stockpiling it right now and no one will stop unless someone else stops. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, so there must be a way inside the Paris Agreement, the world's you know climate agreement, to stop the production of fossil fuels. And I studied it and searched it and started contacting climate experts around the world. There's no way to do it. The words oil, gas, and coal don't even appear in the fossil fuel no in, in the Paris Agreement. They're, Are you they're not being there. Serious? This and neither does the, neither do the words fossil fuels. They don't appear in the Paris Agreement because the industry wants itself to be invisible. That's what they've been doing for years. <laughs> so they've the been putting about? the onus on individuals. It's your fault. You're not wearing a sweater. You're turning your heat up too high. Right. You're driving a car. You you people using plastic straws. It's your fault. And meanwhile. The very few companies on the planet that are making the majority of profits on the planet are producing the three products that they've known for decades are destroying our climate. And they've made themselves invisible and they've made continued production of it okay because we just have to negotiate emissions and we all have to try and reduce emissions. But meanwhile, they're going to keep producing more and more products. It's like drugs, right? Yeah. Here it is, everybody. Here it is. There's so much of it. But then they're going to make us feel bad for using it. So, you know, sometimes... <laughs> I, like, I, I was speechless now. I was speechless listening to you. It's like... Um, you can't believe it. This is one of I those things. I thought I was things. crazy. And you know what? People said I was crazy. Some of my colleagues, people who are climate policy experts who I've admired for decades, they were like, Sapora, climate policy is not about the, the, the supply side. It's only about demand. We're, we just need to focus on reducing emissions and reducing the demand for fossil fuels. And then the markets will constrain supply. Because oh that's, that's the logic, right? It's that that's if, the logic, but it's not working. Because if people stop using it... That's what the yeah. Because people when you start say the using markets, the, we, yeah. the demand will go down, and then the 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 price of renewables will go down, which is which is happening, right? Mm. Wind and solar now cheaper than fossil fuels at scale, it's happening. But we're not producing less fossil fuels and we're not using less fossil fuels. What a lot of people don't realize is even though renewable energy has increased dramatically in ten years. 10 years ago, 80% of all the energy used on the earth was made from fossil fuels. Do you know what it is today? I, w I really want to, I want it to be like 50. 80. It's 80%. No. I knew no you were going to say that. No change in a decade. Because the, we keep using more and more and more energy and they keep it's flooding like the us with getting more. getting bigger, right? Exactly. Like exactly. The slice is the same size. But when I started looking at other issues, it all started to make sense, whether it's nuclear or landmines or you know, CFCs yeah. or are, are lots of chemicals. In no other issue where there's a product that is hurting society, do we only try and reduce the demand. Right. 
we also cut the supply. We regulate the supply. It's like trying to cut with one half of the scissors, right? That's what the economists say. The two half of the scissors are supply and demand. And so we need to regulate the production of fossil fuels. We need countries to negotiate who gets to produce what and how much. Mm. And we can't leave it to the markets at this moment in mm. history. Because because the markets haven't, and, they, and even if they could, they can't do it fast enough. Is that part of the... The markets are distorted because okay. the fossil fuel industry has so much power that they've convinced our governments to give them subsidies. So even though their product is way more expensive now than renewables, the markets don't naturally adjust for it because right. it's artificially propped up by tax breaks and fossil fuel subsidies. And so when people say that, because I had this as a question, when people say governments subsidize the fossil fuel industry. It means governments give the oil and gas companies our money. That's what it means. Every government almost around the world. So the IMF These came are out, companies that make billions, pay billions in bonuses, all of that stuff. And they oh yeah, get record profits, record salaries for CEOs. And then we give them taxpayers dollars at more than we give almost any other industry. So right now, globally, the oil and gas companies are getting $11 million a minute of taxpayers' oh money. Oh, my gosh. $11 million you must, a minute. You must feel, you must have felt like a conspiracy theorist. Because this, totally this is, did. this is But that, is that like, number, by the way, $11 million comes from the IMF, the monetary fund that made that, it made that yeah, um, Like the official report. international monetary international fund. International monetary fund. That was not my research. That's, it, but at the beginning, I felt, yeah, kind of like a conspiracy theorist. But like, this now is one of those things that's like so, when you explain it, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, this is, there is no, this, is we, that, is it, do you know what I mean? Like, this is, that's ridiculous. How is that possible? How could nobody have seen I mean, that or stopped I guess it? It's a massive right? group think, right? Like everyone decided the problem is emissions and the fossil fuel industry spends millions and millions of dollars. In fact, a billion dollars since Paris, five companies, have spent a billion dollars since Paris lobbying to weaken climate policy. And, and so what that means is not only that we have weaker climate policy, it also means that they're literally infiltrating all government decisions around the world. Mm. So there's, they're hiring hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists. They're doing, they're doing thousands of advertisements. So they're uh, creating this kind of group think. And their strategy from the beginning has been, don't make it about our products. Mm. Make it about emissions. Mm. Make it about emissions. Then we'll talk about net zero. And we'll talk about these technologies we'll do or doing. We'll talk about carbon credits and offsets. And it becomes so complicated that meanwhile, in plain sight, they're the ones growing the problem and no one's stopping them. Wow. I mean, it is it is wow. one of those, I feel like, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking that. I was thinking I, I can imagine that it must have been extremely difficult in the beginning for people to believe this because it makes you feel like, it, like it, as a as a person in this world, it makes you feel like, why have I been asleep? Like what, how on earth how, do we not know this? <laughs> well, and a lot of people matrix. tried to make me feel like I was crazy and they were angry about it. And I'll never forget, there's this one conference I went to in Canada because I, I have advised a lot of governments on climate policy. I've been appointed by governments to commissions. I've done a lot of work yeah, inside the system like as well. you're outside the system. You've been working in the system as well as all the other work. I spent four years meeting with the oil companies, with the CEOs mm. of the oil companies to try and convince them to support climate policy and mm. advising governments on climate policy. Mm. And I was at a conference once and a very high up person in government came to me and said, look, Sephora, everybody's talking about it. It's quite rude that you keep talking about fossil fuel production. <laughs> and I said, pardon me, we're at a climate conference. We're talking about climate policy. I'm talking about fossil fuels, which create the climate problem. And she said, well, I mean, it'd just be better if you talked about emissions. You're going to lose your access. People won't want you to come and speak at these conferences because oh, wow. they're finding it quite rude that you keep talking about fossil fuel production. And it was that was the moment for me. And I thought, oh, it's rude. So somehow we've all become part of this big group think that we can't point fingers. Now, I'm not saying there aren't good people in the fossil fuel industry. There are, especially the workers yeah. who are on the oil rigs and who are doing this work. It's, it's not their fault. There are good people, but they're stuck in bad systems. And they've been trying to make sure that we all feel guilty about using the product 
that they create, but then they're not responsible. Right. Right, so Mariam, I've been thinking, how did we start this podcast? That's a great question. So at TEDx London, we're all about ideas worth spreading. We've explored everything from gender and borders to technology and design at our events. We've been doing this for five years. And in that journey, City has been our headline partner, and they've been with us every step of the way. But when it came to the climate crisis, we needed a new format. We wanted to break out of the red circle, to speak directly to the climate leaders, to ask questions and to be curious. And as always, City was there with us, supporting our vision, encouraging us to be courageous and adventurous with our ideas. So thank you, City, for making this podcast and all of our work possible. For the love of ideas, for the love of curiosity, for the love of progress, City. Now back to the show. I mean, this is, I think that's a, a fantastic distinction to make that, you know, there are, there are workers, everyday people who are just making a living, who are stuck in these bad systems. And then you have people with actual power, budgets and decision making who have spent a, their careers doing this and to treat and those people wealth, in the same yeah. way is absolutely not right either. And like, I think it's, I just don't think we make that distinction enough actually to like really mention, um, that the there are because you know I don't know I come from this kind of background like human rights and like labor background and I think you know often the workers are also not treated well by these companies right, right? Oh my like we God. have solidarity For with sure. them they can have solidarity with us as well in Canada the oil industry has been shedding workers like in the last twenty years they have reduced the number of people they have working in the industry by fifty percent they're just laying people off. But production's going up. There's no change, right? Yeah, production's going up, yeah. and that that happens all the time. I really don't think people who work in the fossil fuel industry should see the growing movement for a fossil fuel treaty as a threat, because we all know that we need to get off fossil fuels. We know that it's happening, and what we are calling for with the fossil fuel treaty is a plan. Yeah. So tell us more. Like, how does this treaty work? What is the plan? Like. You know, why is it an important part of this this story? Well, just like with nuclear, so we need we need to stop the expansion. That doesn't mean we turn off the taps overnight. It doesn't mean mm. you can't go fill up your car with gas, and it doesn't mean there aren't still working oil rigs that people are working on. But it does mean that we stop building more of the problem. No mm. more new projects. Mm. You know, for the UK, that means no Campbell oil fields. Yeah. For Canada, it means no new oil sands and fracking. You know, no new stuff. Let's not make the problem bigger. Mm -hmm. So that's the first pillar of the treaty. So we need to negotiate an end to expansion. And then the second pillar is, okay, so how do you then wind down? Well, winding down for some countries has to be faster than for others. And that's where equity and justice comes into the equation. There's going to need to be negotiations to help some countries stop expand, stop fossil fuel production. And a lot of countries right now who are just doing new oil drilling or new coal mines just to feed their debt. Yeah. Mm. Right. So there's going to have to be debt negotiations and debt forgiveness. I work with a number of indigenous nations in the heart of the Amazon that are facing oil drilling in their homes. And the new oil drilling is going in just to feed the debt to China. Mm. Mm. So, so there's going to have to be international negotiations that are based on principles of equity to figure out who gets to produce and how much as we still use fossil fuels between in the next 30 years, between now and 2050. And then the third pillar is based on um, fast-tracking solutions. How do you take the money and the energy and workforce um, mm. that was in fossil fuels, and how do you transition that to fast-track solutions? Even the pipelines that we have today could be used for geothermal instead of oil. Mm. Even the infrastructures, the offshore plat oil rig platforms could hold wind turbines. People who want to could be retrained to have good high paying jobs in renewable or high tech. But we're gonna need those plans. I think right now, pretending like it's not, doesn't have to happen is actually a lot worse for workers and their families right. because then they just don't have a plan. So if we just allow the markets to decide who gets to produce what fossil fuels and how much, it's gonna be an unmanaged decline. It's yeah. gonna decline. We know that it has to if we're gonna survive on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. But, if it, but if we manage it, then less people will suffer. Mm. 
and will have a plan to make sure that no workers are left behind. Yeah, because the markets have never taken care of workers. <laughs> no. I, mean, I mean, know that from history, right? It might manage itself, but it's not gonna. It's not gonna be like equitable for the people who have to retrain. Who no, have to, it'll you be know. the most vulnerable and the least able to, who have the capacity to deal with the changes that we're all facing in our lives, mm. who are going to be left out of luck. Mm. I want to know, the treaty is aimed at governments. It's aimed at who is it, who, uh, the, the signatories of the treaty are governments. Is that? And, well, and eventually oil? they will be. Okay. So what we're trying to do right now is build a, a global movement, a public campaign calling for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So um, what we've done is we've designed basically the, the principles that would be behind the treaty. Mm -hmm. Um, we've brought together a group of academics and former diplomats and advocates from around the world. So not just from the global north, but also from the global south. Indigenous voices. We've got a global steering committee um, that is uh, really an amazing group of people. And then we're going to we're working to try and create both a political pathway for the treaty, but also uh, outreach so that we get more and more people signing to endorse the treaty. Mm. So fossilfueltreaty.org, anyone can sign up there. And from there, there's a campaign hub where if you click on there, it has all the resources so you could campaign in your town. Mm. Because with nuclear, the reason we have nuclear treaties today and landmine treaties today is because people went and asked their city councils to pass motions. Yeah. And the, when the cities start passing motions, then, you know, if you get 10 cities in a country and then the fe and they're all sending letters to their federal government and their national government saying, hey, I want you to negotiate a treaty on this, then that starts to build momentum. Mm. So we're, right now we have a youth initiative. There's a, a letter where youth can sign up to the treaty. We have a scientist's initiative. We have a cities initiative. Um, there's a new one starting with faith leaders from around the world. Um, there's a group of women who are talking about creating a women's initiative for the treaty. So really anyone can go and have the resources to organize. And we're just trying to build up the pressure. And we're only a year old now. We have 101 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama, who have now signed the treaty endorsing it. We have, I think, 16 cities now from around the world and over 2,000 scientists. So this is definitely something that people listening can get involved in. This is not Make just it a, their own. Yeah. Don't wait for us. Go online, take the resources. I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, someone owns the Paris Agreement. Right. We created an idea and now let a thousand flowers bloom. No one owns the idea. We need to push our governments and, and everyone's going to have different ideas of how they can do that. Right. So when we're talking about individual action, we're not so much talking about like, not using plastic straws. We're talking, we're talking about <laughs> lobbying your government. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? We're way past the point in the climate crisis and the ecological crisis that we're living in mm -hmm. where, where whether or not you use a plastic straw or have a disposable cup is, is, is going to um, change everything significantly. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we shouldn't try and do better things in our lives, we all should. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, especially because our kids learn from that. Yeah. You know, and that's people learn what they live, right? Yeah. So so that's really important. But we don't need better light bulbs. We need better laws. We need our governments to take action quickly in the next 10 years, because if not, we're in big, big trouble. Mm. We already have, you know, fires and storms and heat waves and floods sweeping our planet. And we know that it's just going to get worse if we don't stop fossil fuels. Mm. So at this point, if you, if you're wondering, oh, if I, if I, if I don't um, drive and I take the tram, it's going to take me 40 minutes longer, but then I won't have time to organize for Christ's sakes, drive. I love you know, that. like right now, the most important thing you can do is organize. The mm -hmm. most important thing you can do is call your elected official. It's march in the streets. And, and because we have been made to think that all we are is consumers, but we're not, right? We're citizens. Our politicians, our elected officials, they work for us. Mm. And yeah. we have to hold them to account. So Yo, powerful. those guys must be scared of you, fam. Because that, is, <laughs> that listen, yeah. I don't. I get why this dude was like, she's an eco terrorist, and you're not. <laughs> you are the salvation. But that is intimidating. I'm. I've 
don't often spend whole episodes just sitting here in silence no. with my mouth open. I'm like, sorry, this I had is... too much coffee. I'm no, totally no. <laughs> please so... never apologize. I've, I've literally got goosebumps. I know, I know. And I and I actually, Ugh. so normally at this point we go to Climate Confessions and Ben does the whole song and it's always like, <laughs> yeah. song. I, okay, I Ben, would do your song. Climate Confessions. Go, 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 go. But I, want, I <laughs> wanted this Climate Confession to be a little bit different because mm. okay. you said earlier when we were talking about this segment, something really important that kind of goes to the heart of why we talk about climate confessions in the first place right. around like what we've been made to feel and think. And I'm wondering if you might share that about like why we've made been made to feel and think that like we have to be perfect in order to ever do this work. Oh, because I, I think those who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, they're going to benefit and profit from us continuing to use fossil fuels or continuing to log old growth forests they want to make it seem like it's so complicated that you have to be an expert to engage in it mm. because they don't want more of us to engage mm. because mm. the more people who engage, the more powerful we are, right? right. Yeah. Like we're, we are greater together uh, than we are apart. That's what movements mean. It's, it's citizens coming together in all our differences and all of our disagreements. And, you know, that's the diversity and the numbers is what makes us strong. Mm -hmm. And so they keep us apart by making us question ourselves, mm. by sitting at home going, mm, I don't know if it's cap and trade or carbon tax, so I guess I better I better read some more. I better think some <laughs> more about it. You know, like I have three university degrees and when I first, first started working on climate change, I was like so confused by all the numbers and all the different policies. Right. And and I kept thinking, oh, I, I, I can't be a part of this conversation because I don't really understand whether it should be a cap and trade or a carbon tax or a whatever. It's so much simpler than that. Yeah. If they're building more of the bad stuff right now, then they're lying about caring about climate change. Right. That's how simple it is. Stop building fossil fuels. No more pipelines. No more Cambo. No more big projects. Start focusing everything on the good stuff. And we should all at this moment in history be empowering everyone mm. to engage we can't afford to sit home and feel guilty right now. Yeah. It's And that's what they want us to do because they want to keep us isolated. And this is that whole thing of like, what is your carbon footprint? All of that comes from this putting it on the individual. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. And, and it, again, it's not like I'm saying that lifestyle stuff isn't important. I'm a mom. I got kids. I I think, and I and there, you just can't not... Slight, be slightly disgusted at today's lifestyle, right? Like we consume too much. There's too much garbage. That's all of that is true. Yeah. Um, but I think what is sadder than that is we don't think of ourselves as people who can make change, as people who can participate in a meaningful way. Yeah. Mm. You know, like and 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 we all can. And literally, every I feel like person. there's like a thing that we, you know, I try and make it a practice that I engage in other people's in issues and campaigns all the time. You know, at least a couple times a week, I go to someone else's march on, I don't work on food issues, you know, instead of our, or I, I go online and I click here and I sign someone else's petition. And because those little things matter, they add up, mm. right? And that's what politicians look at how many people have signed the letter, how many people were at that march. And right now we need to make noise in whatever way we can. And if you can't do anything, go and cook. Why not? There's a, just a, like, yeah, there's things that there's you can do. There's always something, something you can do. Can do right? if, you, if you can't leave home, then go online, yeah. sign a petition, call up a group and volunteer for them. You know, if Even the, the worst thing people. that people do, I think is, is get, they get in, newly interested in an issue and then they think oh i have to create the new organization that's going to do x and y yeah um and we need to band together mm. and we need to stop trying to recreate the wheel mm. and the the working together that's tough yeah because that means you have to deal with your differences and i think being on a lot of like frontline protests and blockades has forced me to learn how to do that yeah because when you're when you're in a protest situation, you don't know who's going to end up standing beside you. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But you you have a common purpose. Yeah, and so you're just going to work it out. Mm. Wow, 
Wow. Wow. I, I think um, I've said wow <laughs> more than anything else <laughs> in the last. Can you tell us the website one more time? Yeah, fossilfueltreaty.org. That's where people can sign up to become a part of the Fossil Fuel Treaty campaign. And if people want to know uh, more about me and my work, my organization is called stand.earth. And we run a lot of pretty cool climate campaigns on the shipping industry, the fashion industry. So um, there's lots for people to get involved in. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate, subscribe, and share this episode with a curious friend. It makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you. Oh, and slide into our DMs at TEDx London and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time. Oh, and don't leave yet. We wanted to tell you a bit more about who made this podcast possible. Yeah, we did. TEDx London's headline partner, City, has been supporting us for the past five years to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. And now they're taking it to the next level by making this podcast possible. Thanks, City. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hurst. Stay curious.